thank you guys once again for being with us and doing church with us today. It's always better when you're here. The conversation is richer when you're a part of it. And that conversation turns us today to a celebration, celebrating the life overcoming death, love winning over hate, and light breaking through the darkness. Today is Easter. Jesus is risen. Easter is the most fundamental message of hope that we can find throughout our entire origin faith story. Even after suffering and death, Jesus, God made flesh, came, overcame the worst that the world could ever throw at him. And still, he claimed victory. And this just isn't any victory. This is an unexpected kind of victory. It wasn't one with military might or political savvy. No, this victory was one with love. A love so great that Jesus laid his own life down for each and every one of us. Throughout this past week, there have been some high highs and some really low lows. If you see past Sunday, this past Sunday, the church celebrated Palm Sunday when Jesus made his journey into Jerusalem and there was this big parade and it was a big deal. And then he celebrated the Passover with his disciples, one of the most formative meals of the, the Hebrew Bible and, and our friends who are Jewish. With his disciples in the upper room, they ate. Leonardo made a great painting of it. Well, I guess just kidding about that. Leonardo wasn't really there, but, but this was a big deal because Jesus, knowing that he would die soon, told his disciples that God's promises were not going to be just for the Jews anymore, but he was going to extend that table to all people everywhere. This new covenant or, or new promise from God that had no borders was a powerful promise. And then just hours later, Jesus was betrayed by a friend and handed over to an angry government, unfairly tried by the church folk who wanted stuff to remain the same rather than welcome new change in the Messiah. Jesus was passed back and forth by the church to the state when finally Roman governor Pontius Pilate affirmed the crucifixion of Jesus when he couldn't see any other way out of this miscarriage of justice and he tried to wash his hands of it. And then, after six hours on the cross, Jesus died and was buried in a borrowed tomb, and all was quiet. Jesus' followers had left, the disciples were in hiding, and the Son of God suffered the worst that the world could throw at him. And then, then on the first day of a new week, some women came to care for the body of their beloved teacher, their Messiah. On that first Easter Sunday, they found this gigantic stone rolled away and the tomb empty. Convinced that they were being fooled or someone had taken their Lord, they turned to leave the tomb and they saw these two men standing at the entrance of that tomb. These two men were messengers from God to make that first Easter proclamation. And I'd encourage you to, to say these words along with me. Let's say these powerful words together. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He isn't here. He has been raised. And with this, the women go and run and tell the disciples who were in hiding. And yet the disciples didn't believe these women. They thought that they were literally hysterical from their grief. But it's this foreshadowing that allows us to know something that the other two disciples don't as they make this seven mile walk to Emmaus when a stranger joins their journey. The stranger, of course, is Jesus. We, we know that, that something else is going on. And we know this because of act one in our story. If Jesus would have just come out and said what had happened, if he would have made the claim, the two on the road to Emmaus probably would have quickly found a detour or another path to take them away from this guy who is spouting the impossible. Dead people don't just walk around. And there was no chance that he wasn't really dead when they put him in that tomb. And so what does Jesus do? He begins to ask questions. And he engages the two in conversation. They aren't coerced or manipulated, 
but through conversation, they begin to see and feel the Spirit at work throughout the past week. They remember all the other teachings. Their doubts and their questions began to come into focus because of the conversation that they were having with their Messiah, with their Lord. Jesus makes space for a conversation because he knows that scare tactics and yelling on street corners doesn't often work. Very rarely, it may do more harm than good. But rather, through the journey, these two followers began to own their own faith. And like a good guide or therapist, Jesus just nudges them to wrestle with great questions. Hey, can we just pause for a minute? I know that you're in the yeah. middle of something, but, but so far, let's just take stock. We have seen people in total disbelief about the resurrection. And questions and doubts are flying, and rightly so. But did you notice? Did you notice what Jesus has been doing this whole time? He doesn't chastise their questions. N no, in fact, he welcomes them. And so in the coming weeks, we're going to try to take a page out of Jesus's playbook by addressing some of the big questions that we all have about our walk of faith. And so beginning next week, we're starting a series called Practically Faithful. And uh, actually, if you have questions or, or concerns or you'd like to share some yourself, you can actually go to practicallyfaithful.com right now and ask any kind of question that you have about faith. Like, go ahead, try it. This guy won't mind, I promise, okay? Because I fully believe that there is something special that happens when we ask our questions and work out our own faith that makes it stronger. And what once seemed so unbelievable becomes some of the most beautiful parts of our lives. It, anyway, I, I'm so sorry for the interruption. I just wanted to let you know that questions are welcomed here. When the spirit is, is of meaningful conversation and understanding, it is richer when you are a part of it. Okay, great. Thanks. You can get back to your, your sermon now. So as Jesus okay. and the disciples reach their destination, Jesus makes like he's going to continue on until they invite him in. These travelers extend hospitality to Jesus and make space for him. In breaking the bread and extending hospitality, these two see Jesus for who he really is. At this time, at this table, they see hope overcome the darkness. This scene of Jesus breaking the bread would have been known to them and in this simple act, they come to know the culmination of the mission of the Messiah. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus needed to happen in this way so that the sting of death would be no more. They had seen past the pain and the sorrow, and it doesn't mean that life won't hurt us to our core. But in that moment, they realize that death doesn't have the final word. Jesus' death and resurrection is the defining story of Jesus' followers, of Christianity. This encounter changed these disciples because they saw that the worst thing was never the last thing. And they saw light breaking into the darkness and that hope is always on the horizon. And so friends, this Easter, I would encourage you to make some space for Jesus in your questions, in your doubts, allow some space for the possibilities for a new thing to happen. Easter is a time that will remind us that God is always, always with us. And God is doing a new thing throughout all of creation. That God is in the business of restoration and making all things new. And that includes you and me and your neighbor. When we journey with Jesus and make space at our table for him, our eyes will be opened to the hope that proclaims, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He isn't here, but he has been risen. Amen.